Now you can clap again. Praise the Lord. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Good to see you today. We're in a series of messages we've entitled The Secret Place, and this is part five in the series of messages. If you're just now catching up, don't worry, we'll load you right up anyway. Amen. Notice on the left over here, we have our Jerusalem prayer wall that many people have been posting prayer needs on and prayer requests on. We encourage you to keep doing that. That'll be up to the end of the year, as a matter of fact. So even with Christmas decor and everything else, we're going to keep praying. And when we take it down, we'll keep praying then. But let me remind you, anytime you want to come in during the week, during office hours, you can come in. If you want to pray, spend some time praying for needs that are on here. Our staff comes in regularly and we'll take a section of the wall there and lift up the needs that are on there. And uh, we invite you and encourage you not only to place your prayer request up there, but also to come in and pray for some of the needs that are listed there. We've already been getting great reports about how the Lord's been answering prayer. And so let's keep up the praying because God does answer prayer. In fact, he's continually inviting us to pray. So as we've been in this series of prayer, we've talked uh, just kind of back up just a little bit, not over the whole series, but remember the last two weeks we talked about how, how effective prayer works, how that God answers prayer, and on the basis that he answers his prayer. Remember 1 John 5 says, this is the confidence we have, that we ask him anything according to his will. You know, we have confidence that he grants those petitions that we've desired of him. In other words, when we pray according to the will of God, we can be sure that God is hearing us, and that God is granting and giving us those desires and those petitions. And the basis of that is always this, when it's prayed according to the will of God. The biggest thing in our prayer life is getting past our will and discovering God's will. And prayer is the avenue, it is the way, it is the means by which God, kingdom come, will be done, is done on the earth, all right? We see God's kingdom being carried out daily. But the main and most effective work of doing that is in our prayer closets and in our prayer lives. And we've tried to reinstate and reemphasize over and over in this series just how important it is for you to have a prayer life. You have a time when you uh, get along with the Lord and you have communion and fellowship and relationships are, are exercised at that point of really spending some time with the Lord and letting your heart known to God. And in that time, we've discovered God will reveal his will. We talked last week specifically about, about three major elements to knowing and discovering the will of God in our prayer life so that when we do pray, we're not just throwing up a little blank, oh, you know, God, if this is your will, you know, kind of thing, and which is where most people spend a lot of time, well, Lord, if this is your will, you know, this is what I want, and Lord, if it's what you want, then maybe we can work it out, you know. <laughs> That's not prayer, all right? In fact, we go into the throne of grace with confidence when we go in because we do know. We, God re will reveal his desires to us. He will let his purposes be known. And those are the things that we pray. Now, what we laid in, in the groundwork for those last two weeks about praying according to the will of God and effective praying and how to find the mind of God in prayer comes out of that verse, these next two messages, which have a lot to do with our, our position in prayer of standing in a place of warfare. That the Christian life, we know, if you've lived as a Christian very long, is a life of warfare. There's, there's a war going on. There's a struggle between your flesh, all right, and the will of God. There's a struggle between you and the world. The world that we mean that those who exclude God, their philosophy of life does not center around God's will and God's purposes. That's the world that we live in. And even though God loved the world, died for the world, we know that the world stands in opposition to, to the Lord. And then there's that, 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 that infernal foe of ours, the enemy, Satan, we know he's in opposition to us. But I really don't believe that most Christians are aware of just how that opposition is going on and how it works and how effectively and how cunningly Satan really works against our lives. We, we go through life without realizing that there's a war going on many times and we miss what, what God really desires to do in our heart and life because we just don't, we don't see what, what God's really up to in this regard. So we're going to look in Ephesians chapter 6 today. So if you have your Bible, you can open up there. We're going to be looking at several verses. In fact, we're going to be looking at eight or ten verses through there. And we'll kind of pop a few of them up on the screen as we go. But let me, let me share these with you that won't be on the screen from Ephesians 6.10. We'll read about 12 or 13 verses there where Paul is laying this groundwork. Remember in Ephesians, and if you're on Wednesday nights, you know, Pastor Strickland's teaching us through Ephesians. But the, the, when Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, he's, he's laying out their position in Christ in chapter one and who they are and they're seated with Christ and they're children of God. And he's praying a very lengthy prayer in scripture for them in chapter one. In chapter two, he's, he's describing how we used to be separated from God, but God in his mercy and grace has saved us. 
But not only save us by grace, he's also saved us for a purpose, you know, that he might perform his good works through our life so that we walk in the will of God. So he goes through in chapters three, four, and five, he's talking about all the different relationships that we encounter in our Christian life. He deals with our home, deals with our job, deals with our relationship to our parents and our children's relationship to their parents and parents' relationship with their children, husbands and wives' relationship. And he deals with all these things and he tells us, now be filled with the Spirit, all right? In everything you're doing, you need to walk in the Spirit. And then he gets to this part about where the real battle really is. In verse 10 of Ephesians 6, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes or the devices of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, as you look at this passage, all of a sudden, Paul is kind of bringing it up to, as he wraps everything up in this epistle, hey, hey, there's a war going on, folks. And whether it's been back at your job, your children, your finances, or whatever it's been, realize that you are in a battle. And what we're going to discover as we look in the Word of God today and, and glean through these passages, we're going to see that effective prayer is not only discovering the will of God and agreeing with God and praying with God and His will be done, but also involves an attitude of battle. There's an attitude of warfare. I was thinking on the way over here as we recognize veterans as we did this morning and even yesterday uh, at the other campus this morning. It feels like yesterday already. But as we did that, it wasn't an appropriate sermon for Veterans Day as we talk about warfare. Because this is what this passage deals with. And it's praying warfare. It's not just, you know, conflict of hand-to-hand -hand combat and shooting each other, battling one another. It describes the arena of warfare. It lets us know who the enemies in the warfare are. It lets us know the equipment for warfare. I mean, it's all just really clearly laid out. There's about four points I want to share with you. First one has to do with this, that the Christian life is a life of warfare. I don't remember who made this statement. I just remember writing out of my Bible one time. It says, a Christian who has no conflict is a Christian who has retreated from the front lines of service. Let me say it again. A Christian who has no conflict is a Christian who has retreated from the front lines of service. Now, when Paul's laying out this letter to the Ephesians, you have to kind of, let me step back. I know maybe if you were here for Wednesday nights, Tim's already kind of given you a brief overview of this passage. But understand when Paul goes to Ephesus, and a lot of it's recorded in the book of Acts, he's there and he, he meets some of the disciples of John and leads them to faith in Christ. He spends three months there at first speaking in the local synagogues and in, the, in any place, the public platforms, even in the school Tyrannus. Acts puts it this way, it says, this took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both the Jews and the Greeks. And it goes on to say in Acts 19 that while he was in Ephesus, that there were great works and wonders being performed by the hand of, of Paul. Uh, and you follow his story, he, he's reaching a lot of people, he's leading a lot of Jews to Jesus, he's leading Gentiles to Jesus, all the time God's demonstrating his, his power. In Acts it says, and the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. But at the same time that Paul's experiencing these great victories, he's in war. I mean, people want him dead. People are talking about him. They're having meetings about him. I mean, they're, 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 you know, the Jews want to kill him because they don't like the message of grace versus law. And the Jewish Christians, they want to kill him too because they don't understand the context of the Gentiles and the law and the relationship there. And so, you know, there's this, there's this constant opposition that's going on. He's mimicked by, you know, the apostate Jewish exorcist when they try to be like him. And then he's also facing opposition from, from Demetrius. If you remember that story in the book of Acts, he was one of the guys who was a silversmith and all his fellows with him. They made idols that would be worshiped in Ephesus. So what's happening is the gospel's going out. People are getting saved and it's just ruining Demetrius's business. So they want him killed. Everywhere you turn, there's somebody that is opposing him and coming up against him. It's in those times that our battle is not with flesh and blood. We're fighting a war, but it wasn't, he didn't identify those people as his enemy. In fact, all that trouble he's going through, most ministers would already be signing their resignation letter. At this point, ah, this, is, well, this must not be God's will. This must be I'm not done here. <laughs> we don't realize that when we are in the will of God, there is, there's conflicts. There's wars everywhere we turn in the Christian life. And, and Paul wrote the Corinthian church, pretty much the same thing as he described a lot he was going through. But he, he told them in 2 Corinthians, I mean, where are we here? Uh, did I pass it up? Go back to the last slide. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He says, we don't walk in the flesh, 
But we war. And our war is, 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 is spiritual. It's not a carnal war. In other words, he's saying it. Although I've had a lot of opposition from a lot of people, they are not the enemy. Man, we'd have revival in church today if people realized that. That nobody in this church is your enemy. You'd have revival at your house today. You know, you think your kids are the enemy. You think your husband's the enemy. You think your wife's, they're not the enemy. That's not where your battle is. And if you misunderstand this, that the whole context of the Christian life being warfare, warfare then you certainly misunderstand a lot that's going on. In 1 Timothy 6, 12, Paul's writing to Timothy, this young minister in, in the Word of God, and he says, listen, you need to fight the good fight of faith. Now, later on in the, in, in the next letter, in 2 Timothy, he says, I have fought the fight. I ran the race. I have contended in this battle. But what's the battle? Is it against unbelievers? No. Is it not even really against the world? He said, it's those things that are behind, the things behind the scenes, the things that you don't see with physical eyes. The Christian life is warfare, but we need to understand where it's fought and how it's fought. In Matthew chapter 11, it says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. Now, I've never really got a grip on that sermon until I heard Mickey Bonner preach it one day. And he took the Amplified Bible, which is basically, they look at the Greek text and they translate it into English and then they amplify the words for the sake of understanding, which, which are there. So it's not adding, it's just amplifying. From the days of John the Baptist until the present time, the kingdom of heaven has endured violent assault and violent men seize it by force like a precious prize. A share in the heavenly kingdom is sought with the most ardent zeal and intense exertion. The idea behind it now is a little different from what we would read just in the English language. It gives us this idea. There's a kingdom to be received. There's a kingdom to be taken. It's the kingdom of God for us. And we need to be zealous like valiant warriors pursuing God's kingdom and God's will and God's purposes for our life. We don't need to be lethargic. We don't need to be dead. We need to be energized within our spirit and realize, hey, there is an arena out here, a spiritual world, a spiritual life, it's to be lived, but you're not gonna live it by sitting on your hands. You're not gonna live it by, without pursuit. You're not gonna live it without commitment. You're not gonna live it without a sacrifice, without disciplines and without a cost in your life. There's a war to be won. And it can easily be accomplished when we understand the principles of what's going on in this particular warfare. Point number one is pretty simple. The Christian life is warfare. Point number two is similar. The Christian warfare is spiritual. It is a spiritual arena. And the things that are spiritual are not the things, as the scripture says, that are seen. There are things that are not seen. And if you follow the principle of that lesson is that the only way to see into the spiritual arena is to be a spiritual person. The only way to be a spiritual person is to be born of the spirit. So first of all comes this conversion. You're born of the spirit. The second thing that follows that now is discipleship. I'm walking with Jesus and as I do it, I'm enjoying this new life, this spiritual life that came to me by spiritual birth and I'm learning to understand what it means to live in a spiritual world. Ephesians 6, 12, he says, for the, the weapons, for, he said, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against what? Rulers and powers and world forces of darkness against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. He said, there's a war going on, and where is it? And he tells us at this point, in fact, he mentions about four categories in this passage in verse 12. If you have your Bible open where he talks about, you can underline principalities, powers, rulers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Those are the things that you and I if we're going to live the Christian life and be the kind of spiritual warriors and soldiers that God's called us to be, these are where the enemy lies. If you don't know who the enemy is, you're never going to win the war. Don't you wish you could tell that to the government agencies around us today? <laughs> You've got to know who the enemies really are. If you can't identify the enemy, how are you going to win the battle? In the Christian life, the enemy is clearly identified and he's dealing with demonic forces. And in fact, it, it, it's like rank of order. It, it's like there's a, it, it, it's, it breaks it down in principalities, powers, rulers, and, and, and spiritual wickedness. And each of these have to do with, with, with uh, structure. It's like in our military, you know, you have the generals and you have right on down the line with each officer and they report to this officer, which reports to this officer. It's the way it is in Satan's command and, and the way that he operates. Now that you caught up, let me get past that next verse. Is it working back there? Well, it's not working up here. Let's just leave it alone, all right? Save yourself the time. 
sit back, enjoy the sermon. Because <laughs> you're bothering me. <laughs> Four areas. Listen to them again. Principalities. You know what that is? That's a word which has to do with rank. It has to do with magistrates. It has to do with order. Here's what the scripture tells us, not only here where it talks about Ephesians, but in Romans it mentions this again. It talks, Paul's talking about how principalities will come against the Christian's life and seek to separate you from the grace, the love, and the blessings of God. But Paul said, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come can separate me from the love of God. But you need to understand, they will try. They can't but they will seek to cut you off. They will seek to isolate you. They will seek to destroy your life. But not only that, he talks about powers. That is a word which we translate into uh, the Greek word was exousia. And it's a power word in the, in the Greek language, but it has to be more with personalities like angels or angelic beings. So we know that as a Christian, angels are on our side, but you have to understand also that there's another group of angels that aren't on your side. All right, we don't like to think about them. We like to talk about our angel and how God's assigned us an angel. And, you know, I think some of you need four or five like myself, but nonetheless, the angels, are, but he's talking about another. Remember when the, the, uh, in the book of Revelation, I'm assuming you've read it, where Paul is, uh, Paul, John's caught up into the heavens and he says, I saw around about the throne of God, there were 10,000s of 10,000s of 10,000s of angels worshiping the Lord. Now, if you follow the mathematic equation of 10,000th to the 10,000th power to the 10,000th power, it comes out to a whole punch. All right? There's a whole bunch of angels, multiplied millions upon millions of angels. Now, this is after one third have already fallen. So there must be millions of demonic spirits out there, angels who fall into this category of the principalities and the powers and the rulers of wickedness that are in high places. They're seeking to manipulate, to control, to destroy. Now, as a Christian, we know that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. But understand that like everything in the Christian life, the truth must be appropriated. The truth must be received. The truth must be believed. The truth has to be acted upon in faith or it doesn't happen in my life. Salvation, I can dream about it all day long, but until by faith I receive Jesus, I'm not saved, right? There's a commitment in my heart, a commitment in my life to Christ. You believe in your heart. So what happens? Now you're saved. I believe there's these demonic forces, but I also need to believe that God has given me victory in my life over these things in my life and how to stand against these forces, how to believe God when these things attack my life, attack my marriage, attack my home, and what to do about it because they are real spiritual forces of wickedness and he calls them in high places. And it is wickedness. They have everything to do with destroying your walk. There's supernatural forces but you have a supernatural God. And as a child of God, you may not get this, but let me tell you honestly, you are a supernatural person. You're not what you used to be. When you gave your life to Jesus, you became completely different. You're, you're not like the rest of the world. And I think a lot of people's problem is they try to be like the rest of the world. And you're not gonna be happy there. You're not gonna succeed. You're not gonna feel fulfillment in your life as long as you're trying to fit the mold. Romans 12, talks, we talked about last week about being transformed by the renewing of your mind, not being conformed to the world. So part of this transformation process is, as I'm living for Jesus, I realize there's an enemy out there and as Jesus dealt with him, I have to deal with him too. And the best thing I can do is look at the word of God and see the instruction that God gives me and how to deal with these little imps of hell that seek to destroy my life. But I have to, first of all, wake up to the fact and embrace the truth that there is a war going on all around me every day. And I'm going to either win in that war or I'm going to lose in that war. All too many believers in the churches today are losing that war. They come to church, they smile, they sing the songs of victory, they sing about power in the blood, but 90% of them don't have enough power to blow their nose, spiritually speaking. Amen. Yeah, it's all well and good. But when they look at the reality of where they are and what the Bible says, there's like this chasm. You know, how do you, how do you breach that? How do you get across that to where the Bible says we are more than conquerors? Yet we've been living like a little less than cowards. 
where's the step? The step is in, number one, you got to learn how to read the Bible. Number one, two, you got to learn how to pray the Bible and agree with what the word of God says about you in your life. The Christian life is warfare. The Christian warfare is spiritual. The third point is the spiritual war requires spiritual armor. If you look in verse 14, stand firm. Stand firm. Having girded your loins with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16. And add to that, in addition to that, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And with all prayer and petition, pray at all times with this in view, be on the alert with perseverance and all, all perseverance and petition for all the saints. What's he saying here? All right, you realize there's a war going on. Now you need to get dressed for it. You got to get dressed for war. All you vets here today, you understand that clearly, right? There's, a, you need your equipment. You need, you need to be prepared to fight. You've got, you, you can't enter into the spiritual arena naked. And some of you are trying to fight your battle literally spiritually naked. And he says, you can't win that way. Now you're gonna be anything but embarrassed and ashamed. It's when you enter in that environment, it's a different world than this little world we're living in here now. It's a different venue. And so you prepare yourself and he tells you how to spiritually prepare yourself. See, one of the things I, I, I love doing is, is a pastime and a hobby of mine is scuba diving. Uh, I know some of y'all don't get it, but I just love it. All right. I, I, I love it. And say, why do you love somebody? Hey, at a hundred feet, you can't hear anybody whine. <laughs> there's no emails. There, there, there's, there's no phone calls. There's none of that's going on. It's just quiet. All you can hear is a little shrimp chirping, you know, a little chatter going on. Oh, it's, just, it, it's a different world. But hey, you can't just jump in the water and get drop to 100 feet. All right? Now, I'll tell you what, if you don't have your equipment on, you die. How do you know this? Because I've almost done it once or twice. I've probably done this three, at least registered about 300 different dives. But I can't tell you how many times in a hurry, having all this information in my head, I want to get in the water, roll out backwards in the water and forgot to put my regulator in my mouth. First gulp of air, you get nothing but salt water. You, you start looking for the regulator real fast. But that's the way people do their spiritual life. They don't realize this is a, you can't operate by the same old way you operate. You get in the water, everything changes. You get in the war, it's different. Most Christians never get into that arena. They think they're already in it, but they're, like they say, they're, they're unprotected and they usually end up in bondage and captivity. So he tells you right here, oh, here's what you're doing. And I'm not going to go into the details of each one of these. Just, just a brief mention. Tim's preaching on Ephesians. He can cover a little bit more on Wednesday nights. But he talks about have your loins girded with truth. All right. This, the truth is, 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 is not just the truth of God's word, because we'll see that in a moment. But he's talking about being true to something. What am I true to? I'm true to God's word. I'm true not only in my belief, but in my practice. That I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm applying truth to my life. The Bible says if we worship God, we worship him in spirit and in truth. The truth there is a word which is similar to this word having to do not so much with the object of the word of God is truth, like we'll see in a moment the sword of the spirit is, but this has to do with a transparency and an openness and, a, and, a, and, a, and, and you know, hiding nothing from God, a clear conscience, a commitment to Christ, just genuine faith in Jesus. Loins gird with truth, breastplate of righteousness. Now righteousness is not something we earn, it's given to us. It means I'm right with God. So if I'm going to enter into a spiritual arena, I need protection for the vital organs here, right? So what is that protection? It's the righteousness of God. Where do I get that? You received it as a gift from God, according to Romans chapter five, when you gave your life to Christ. But just because I did that many years ago, that's not good enough. It means today I appropriate. Today I'm right with God. Today my heart is pure. Today I'm walking with Jesus. Today I'm committed to Christ. So if I'm going to fight today, I need to be clean today and prepared today. And my feet are shod. I like this with the preparation. The word has to do with readiness of the gospel of peace. I'm ready to move forward. The one thing about the Roman legion was, is that where, whenever they were called upon, I mean, they were, they were ready in an instant to wake and go to war. Uh, it's interesting to watch on the news this week, the 82nd Airborne over in Spain working with the European forces, working on readiness, you know, that we are prepared to roll wheels up in so much time we're out of here and it's done. 
We have people jumping out of airplanes at 800,000 feet in an instant. We're, we're going to cover this area. It was all about preparation and readiness. We as Christians have to live in an anticipation that we're going to be called on at any time and ready for it and prepared for it. And the preparation we have is the gospel. And I love this. They say, well, Joe, we're in a war. I don't get this gospel of peace stuff. The gospel of peace means, one, I have peace with God because of the gospel. Praise God. But also, when I go to war, I realize who the enemy is. It's not mankind. I'm taking them the gospel of peace, how they can have peace with God. All right? My battle is with the enemy. My battle is with the devil. My battle is with these little minions that we've been talking about. So I'm, my feet are shod with the, with, the, with the power of the gospel and the word of God, so with no hesitation. Shield of faith, he said, you can quench all the fiery darts, all the flaming arrows. And Satan shoots them at us all the time, doesn't he? But I can quench them. Those arrows usually come through in, in, in a myriad of ways, but they, they usually come through with things like doubt or despair or disbelief. Words like this, as you say, I'm going to stand for Jesus. And the devil says, oh, I won't work for you today. Oh, you tried that before, didn't you? How'd that work out for you? Or you're not good enough. Or you're not, you're, you haven't been saved long enough. Or you don't know enough of the Bible. Or nobody likes you anyway. <laughs> or you're not, you're not, you're not smart. You're going to be, oh, those are just flaming darts. All right, and we'll see in a moment, we have something to protect us in that regard, but to stop them immediately is this shield of faith, my commitment to God. And so, what, so if this dark comes in, well, Joe, you can't do that. If God said I could do that, then for me to hold my shield of faith, I mean, so well, God said, it's the same thing, the same thing in the wilderness when Jesus is being tempted three times, Satan comes, it has God said, Jesus said, it is written. What's he doing? That's the shield of faith. I stand on what's written. I stand upon the word of God. I stand on what the Bible says. That's where my, that's where my victory is. That's where I am standing. That's my shield of faith. And the helmet of salvation. Uh, most every preacher I ever talked to and read after this kind of gets down to this. Well, it just me. it has to deal with the security of the believer, that you know that you know you're secure in Christ, that you know you're saved. Well, I'll, that's the, uh, the great part of it. But I think it goes even a little deeper in that. It means that, if it's protecting my head, what is doing that? My helmet of salvation. I have been redeemed, all right? I am born again. I belong to God. So number one, I don't have to take this stuff from the devil, all right? I, 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 I belong to Jesus. Now, if I haven't got that settled and my faith is not committed and I'm not following Jesus, then I'm gonna be an open target. But there's this, there is an, an assurance that that breeds a confidence in your walk, if it's in your heart, that I know, that I know. Uh, your practical experience probably teaches. Some of you have been saved a long time. Some of you haven't known the Lord that long. But I can tell you, for every one of us who've known the Lord for any length of time, one of the first attacks that Satan makes upon our life, he's trying to take our helmet from us. He don't want you to be secure. I don't know if I'm really saved, Pastor. I'm not sure I'm born again. I don't know. I, I think I am, but I don't know. And, I like to think I am, boy. You need to get this settled. How can you know? The Bible says these things are written. It'd be a good time to do a Bible study. You say, where do I study? First John, about six times. And he says, hereby we know we're the children of God because there'll be some obvious signs. You love God's people. You love God. You love the word. You like hanging around Christians. I mean, those are all good signs that you're saved. All right. You know, you're in a war. You know how Satan's coming against you. Those are good signs. Most of all, I just simply go back to my past record. All right? It's, uh, what's your past record? I gave my life to Jesus. I remember when it was, and I remember what I did. And it lines up with what the Bible said. That settles it. That settles it. But it'll come on all other kinds of doubts, right? Seeking to destroy, seeking to mess up your life, seeking to, to ruin things. He doesn't want you to get a grip. So you have this helmet of salvation. It deals with the, the enemy's discouragement. And his lies. The Bible says you bring every thought into captivity. You can do that because you have the helmet of salvation. The sword, which is the word of God. In fact, it calls it the sword of the what? The sword. In other words, it's a spiritual weapon. It's a spiritual weapon. In other words, it's not just this Bible. It's what this Bible says. It's what I believe in this Bible. It's what I understand of the Bible. The sword, which is the word of God. The word there, if a word is not the word logos, like you see, like we said, Jesus, the living logos, the living word. It's the word rhema in the Greek language, R-H-E-M-A. Been highly misunderstood word in some circles. 
but it basically means that which is revealed. So my sword are the truths that God has revealed to me that I know to be true by practical experience. Have you got that? It's a revelation. It's that I know by practical experience, the word of God, I've spent time with God. I've walked with God. I've memorized the word. I'm in his word. I'm living for Jesus today. And guess what happens when something occurs on the battlefront, I can pull my sword and guess what? I know what sword to pull when it happens because God's revealed it to me. Revelations come, knowledge has come. So that when Satan attacks my wife, I know where to go. I know what to stand on in the Bible. I know what to, what to use against the enemy. I, this sword, I, I, I use it. I don't just have a nice little sheath to carry it in so I look good with the sword. All right? It's not just a fashion statement. It's to be used. You swing it. You stab with it. You slice with it. You cut with it. You're aggressive with it. So that when Satan comes and I see him impeding upon my territory, the turf which God has put under my domain, and by the way, we all have some, all right? Your family, your job, those things which God has put you to be a steward over, you have a responsibility there to weld your sword. Satan comes and he starts trying to steal my children. Then I can come with a sword and I can let Satan know, hey, Satan, hold on one moment here. You're not the Lord of this house, Jesus is. And number two, you're not even the little G God of this house. I are. <laughs> all right? I am. And you cannot have my children. You cannot have their soul. You can't have their heart. You can't have their mind. You can't have their life. They belong to Jesus. Therefore, they're not yours. In Jesus' name, you release your grip. Amen. That's the sword. That's swinging your weapon. That's welding what God's placed in your hand. That's, that's, that's the power of the God's word, though. We see that it's not, it's not like any other book. The scripture says the word of God is living. And it's not only living, it says it's active. And it goes on to say, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword. So we have this spiritual weapon. But if, let me tell you this, listen carefully. If you don't know it, and you don't read it, and you don't spend time in it, you had not even got a buck knife. <laughs> you know? You're walking around with a toothpick hoping to fend off the enemy. If all you got John 3.16, and bless God for John 3.16... Bless your heart. Better find you a strong believer to stand behind. <laughs> you need to be in it and you need to understand it. The fourth and last point is this. Not only in spiritual war, it requires not just spiritual armor and weapons. It, require, it requires spiritual tactics. Verse 18. With all prayer, you can underline that, and petition. So it's all prayer and all petition. Pray at all times. <laughs> In the spirit, with this in view, since we're in a spiritual war, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Four times the word all is used there. So I think we ought to pay a little bit of attention if there's a lot of all going on here. What am I supposed to do? I'm all dressed up. I've been in the word. I'm living for Jesus. I'm ready to face the enemy. I'm, I'm prepared for it. I'm the strength, the grace, the might that I have in my life. I'm strengthening the power of his might. So it's greater than the devil's might. No matter how big the devil gets, God's bigger. I'm trusting him. What do we do now? Where's the front line? It's in your prayer closet. You know, you know, and, and men are especially bad with this. We think we can just figure everything out. That's why men don't read directions, by the way. In case you've ever wondered that, ladies. Why don't you get mean the directions? Because I'm smarter than the directions. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> From the men at least. We don't need no thinking directions. Yet. <laughs> but we need these directions. And we need to be absorbed with them. And we need to be claiming them. And we need to be standing in them. And then we're ready for war. And where are we going to meet the enemy? We're going to meet him in prayer. So I take, I take my weapons. I take my armor. And I, even in prayer, I start my prayer life. With, Lord, I'm trusting you today. I'm believing you. Uh, and today I'm, I'm, I'm accepting that I'm clothed in your armor. So I, I appropriate this armor, this helmet, this, my loins, girded by the truth, breastplate of righteousness, my feet. Lord, all this, I'm committing my heart completely to you. And I'm trusting you to cover me with the armor. Now what do we do? So we start praying. Let your prayers be known. Let your petitions be known. Get with God. Speak with God. And what will happen? As soon as you do. In fact, I'll tell you this. Here's how important prayer is. It's proven by your own personal experiences. Well, I don't pray much. That's the point. 
It shows you that it's a spiritual arena. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual war because Satan will do everything he can to keep you from praying. He'll do everything he can to keep you out of the Word of God. I mean, just if you don't have a prayer time, commit to it. Say, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up 15 minutes earlier and just spend that time with God. I'm going to get dressed, get ready, but I'm going to take the 15 minutes after get my head together, have my coffee. I'm going to sit down and spend some time with God. You let me know tomorrow how that goes. Because all hell is going to come against you. And you won't even recognize it. It'll be something like, oh, man. Okay, here I am. Did I close the refrigerator? Did I left the refrigerator door open. I think I, is, is that beeping in there? Is that refrigerator, did that left refrigerator open? Oh, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Fifteen million things will come into your mind to distract you, to get you pointing at Oh, maybe you ought to get to work a little bit early because you can have some problems. So we need to take care of that. We can get down there and fix that. Isn't that true? So even our practical experience shows you that this is a battle and that this is where the battle starts. And so you enter in and you take your sword with you and you take your armor with you and you start praying. And even in the con if, you, if you keep a prayer list, great. But even in the context of just praying for your prayer list, you're going to find war. And this is what you need to do while praying in that prayer. You need to be warring over those petitions. You've got armor on for a reason. Having done all to stand, he says, stand praying. Stand firm, do what? Pray. So if I have a need here, a petition here, a supplication or whatever you want to call it, that's where I take and appropriate God's weapons. What does the Bible say about my children? What does the Bible say about my job? What does the Bible say about my finances? What does the Bible say about that person I'm having trouble with at work? What's the Bible say about my situation? And that's where I go and I lift up the sword of the spirit in that situation. One, to the Lord and say, Lord, I believe your promises. And two, to jab the enemy and say, God fulfills his promises in Jesus' name. I will trust him instead. I'll not believe your lies, and I'm not going to tolerate your junk. Now, I know we'll talk about this more next week. Some of you are thinking right now, I don't think we should talk to the devil. The book of Jude says that not even Michael the archangel brought a railing accusation against the devil. And he only said, the Lord rebuke you. Listen, if you just say that, you'd have victory. If that's, a, if that's a cross point for you, just say, the Lord rebuke you in Jesus' name. Yes. But I believe that Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. And now you're my ambassadors. You speak on my behalf. You're the ministers of reconciliation. You're in charge. You're the stewards of this domain. And whatsoever you bind on earth must be bound in heaven. That to me is a pretty strong word to go start binding something. <laughs> and I believe it. it's not me. It is the Lord in me speaking. I'm in agreement with what God says. God says, don't let Satan have your family. Okay, Satan, you can't have my family. He says, who says? Jesus. Ooh. Okay. But it's persistent prayer. And it is warfare praying. The enemy doesn't go down always in the first battle. Some things take a long time to do battle in. Satan has sunk his feet in deep. You sink yours in even deeper. You stand and you pray with petitions and with supplications saying, this is God's. They are God's. This belongs to God. Satan, you don't have the authority here. Jesus has the authority. I tell you, Kathy and I have used a principle I'm going to share with you next week about praying with authority and praying with prayer. For people in our own home, they've come and stayed with us over the years. We've, we've taken in some strangers. Until I got a church and I took a whole bunch of you in. So. <laughs> Amen. But to see in prayer how God would specifically move. Having a family member at the house one time. And knowing that their lives were not really right with the Lord. And let them know they could stay with us, but yes, you know, nothing's going to go in our house. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't according to God's will and purposes for our family. And to know that that person, to hear them off in the background devising a plan to go off and party or whatever it might be. For Kathy and I just to go to the back room and say, let's just take a moment. We know they're planning something. We know Satan's planning something. Let's just pray. And to simply say a word of an agreement with God. God, we know that you have a plan for that person's life and you love them dearly. And Satan's working in that room over there, and he's working in their mind. And we ask you in the name of Jesus to cancel that effect. 
that those little minions of hell are having in their life today. That you're greater and you're mightier. And I ask you in Jesus' name to cut off the enemy's voice to them today. And for you to move and to speak to them clearly with conviction in the name of Jesus. This is your will for their life. We read it in Scripture. You're not willing that any should perish. This is your will. So we know we're praying. So we thank you for answering our prayer today. And to see them come in there and say, where are you going? I think I'm going to stick around here tonight. <laughs> I think we're going to stick around here tonight. It's just, it, it, you know, and Kathy and I, we just sat there and grinned at each other. Because you just saw God do something. Something visible, something tangible, something that you can calculate. I prayed God moved. I prayed according to God's will, God moved. I prayed against the devil. And God moved. And Satan had to give up his possession. He had to give up his place. This is what I'm talking about. If we don't know who the enemy is, we're going to be defeated all our life. If we don't know how to address the enemy, we're going to be defeated all our life. If we don't know how to find God's will, we're going to be defeated all our life. And it's the, the simplest of it all is, it all becomes, it all unfolds to us. The more we walk with God, the more we seek God, the more we study His Word, this just becomes a way of living. Somebody might put it in an outline form. Somebody might present it in four points, five points, or sub sub points, and illustrations, and a nice closing story. But nonetheless, if you're living for Jesus, with a real commitment to Christ, these things are starting to unfold to you every day. And you're starting, and the lights are coming on. Saying, that's right. That's, and so that when it's preached, you're just saying, "Yeah, that's that's exactly where I am. That's exactly what I need. That's what God. Yeah, thank you, Lord." And you, in turn, you turn around and put it back in the enemy's face. I don't know about you. You know. Some of you think that you just get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you just kind of say, okay, Satan, that's enough. You've been giving me hell for years. I hope you're ready because I'm getting ready to give you a whole bunch of it. Heaven. And that's hell to you. Amen. So we're going to rise to the occasion, get ready for war, stand and pray. See what God does. Stand and believe. See what God does. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me?